e tui mā koromā, Rangi Pira mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Dame Tariana, kia ora. Tā Mason, kia ora, i minister. Kwa rendus pōr toko wingo no Ngāti Apa Rangatani me te Rārua Ho. My grandmother grew up in central Auckland. She never learned to speak her language, but she learned to speak Cantonese because the brown kids in central Auckland hung out with the Chinese kids. And until the day she died when she was 93, could still play a mean game of Mahjong. And if she could see me up here today, I think she'd be howling. So thank you for your patience. What I want to talk to you about today is somebody, uh, the work of people like me who play with this data. Um, it was going to be Tahu Kukatai giving this talk. Tahu is elegant, slim, articulate, but you've got me, okay? So, sorry about that. Um, I am, I've been playing with big data since 1990, and uh, it's something that, for, for some reason, I, see, I seem to enjoy. But one of the things I get out of it I learned from Edel Pormati, um, actually in this building, saying that data changes people's minds. And uh, he was doing the Māori mortality work, that, uh, and Neil Pearce and I are currently updating that. And I wish I had some good news for you about uh, how things are going, but uh, you'll have to, have to wait and see, but it's not that good news. Anyway, on to Tukupenga. Now, Tahu and myself have been doing some work for Kupinga for a couple of years. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is um, a couple of things, a little bit about Kupinga and what it tells us about whānau wellbeing. The other thing I want to uh, tell you a little bit about is about what the challenges are in measuring whānau wellbeing in the official data space, but also not just to be solely negative, what are some of the opportunities? Because I see huge opportunities uh, and it, in a way that we could actually be seriously engaged and make a real difference for our tamariki and our whānau. So what is Te Kupinga? Now Te Kupinga is a nationally representative survey of Māori aged over 15 plus. So that's important to know. It's about Māori adult, adults. Also important, it's about Māori by ancestry and or ethnicity. So one of the things about the official stats system, especially the data that exists in health, education and welfare, is about Māori by ethnicity only, so which misses about 120,000 of us right, who only report ancestry. And I can tell you from some work we've done with the census data that about 25% of Ngāi don't say they're Māori by ethnicity. Right? So that metric, right, we are losing people by the way we're measuring people. So um, that's one thing that uh, we have to look at. But Tukuping has already addressed that. It's an extremely high quality survey, and all credit to Te Atafai, uh, to, to Te Atafai and uh, Scott and the team. I don't know how you got this funded, but also I don't know how, <laughs> in a time when resources are scarce, I, but I don't know how you managed to do it first off so well. It was a really good survey. It's got an excellent sampling frame, as the government statistician said, in the census but it had a really good response rate of 78%, which any survey statistician would be proud of. Um, it had 5,500 or so participants, um, and in doing that, it is a nationally representative study, so it produces estimates of what's going on for the entire population. So it doesn't work so well for regions, but it works really well nationally. Also, they create a confidentialised unit record file. Now, what that means is it's a big, long... It, group of words to mean that you can actually take the data out of that secure environment that the government statistician was telling you about so researchers can actually use it on their own computer and resources um, because it's been so confidentialised it's impossible to identify anybody. So what's new about it? Well, first of all, it's the New Zealand's first survey of Māori wellbeing, right? Um, and in doing so, it has not only just the standard social and economic measures of wellbeing, it has cultural measures in there as well. And it has specifically questions about whānau and whānau wellbeing. It is informed, um, it is the first survey in New Zealand, uh, first official survey um, to be informed by tikanga. And the whānau wellbeing question is basically really simple. It says, how's your whānau doing? And it has an 11-point scale. Please don't do that again, Scott. They're impossible to analyse. 
Um, but it has a scale, and you mark um, and, or indicate how well you think your whānau is doing between extremely badly and extremely well. And what this is, you need to note, is it's reported well-being. Okay? So it's how people are reporting how their whānau is doing. It's also subjective, right? It's not measured, right? And it's somebody's opinion. Now, now some people say, oh, but that's, you know, you need to actually have something you can sit down and measure, like income or something like that. But with whānau well-being, if you're talking to whānau members, if they perceive the state of their whānau to be, in, uh, if they perceive their whānau to be in a certain state, then that is what they'll act on. Not what's in the bank balance, it's how they perceive their whānau to be doing. So that's why that's, um, that's extremely useful. So what kind of variation do we get? Well, you can see pretty much things are, things are pretty good. There's a big long tail there, which is a bit of a concern. Um, and a statistician would make that disappear by dropping off those last few categories. But, um, <laughs> but so what causes that variation? Well, with a lot of well-being stuff, it is associated with age, and whānau well-being is no different. And you can see in quite an unusual age variation um, there that the younger people think their whānau are doing, doing um, sorry, a higher proportion of younger people think their whānau are doing well um, than those in the middle age groups, and a similar percentage of the over 55 think their whānau is doing well. So it's, it's, having more costs seems, seems to make you feel a bit better about, um, about your whānau. But then there's a whole lot of other demographic factors that we could analyse um, individually but in order to get a real picture, we, the statistician throws all of those vi different variables into the mix and comes up um, with and, and comes up with the ones that are most important. Now we've already heard about Superu's um, Fano Rangatiratanga principles and the framework. So what we did is we took that framework and then populated it with data that's from Tukupinga, and you can see that um, in those um, various capability measures, even using Tukupinga, there are gaps, right? That is, um, so even using a Māori-informed survey, there are gaps. And this is one of the issues that we need to address if we're developing frameworks to guide improving whānau wellbeing. Those frameworks need to be translated into gathering information, whether it be um, quantitative data or qualitative information, can it actually be used for decision making? So we, when we've then filled in um, those gaps, we've overlaid that with, with age, sex, and region, and household family type, because there is some difference based on some work that I did with Cindy Kittle on uh, whānau wellbeing or family wellbeing and family, family type. So what about each of, the, uh, each of those dimensions? Interestingly, the cultural dimension didn't affect whānau well-being at all. And that's probably because it's, it's its own well-being measure. Right? So it wasn't actually trans translating into whānau, reported whānau well-being by the survey respondents. We did have some impact from um, economics, from not ha having enough income. Now, that had quite an unusual pattern. I didn't quite expect this, but what was it was driving just for some age groups perceived low whānau well-being. So it was associated low um, not having adequate income was associated in some age groups only of, ha of having poor whānau well-being. But having surplus um, income had no relationship to to, um, to a whānau doing really well. So it seems to be one of those threshold things, that you'd need enough to get you out of the bad spot, but it doesn't drive really high levels of, of well-being for whānau. The social dimension, um, again, this was a bit of a surprise. We thought um, the expression of manakitanga uh, <coughs> by providing unpaid help with, uh, for others might actually be positive. It actually ended up having a negative effect, probably associated by the fact if you're having to provide help for others, it's because um, maybe your whānau isn't doing doing that well. Um, again, there are some big age differences here, but mainly the social dimensions were associated with lower levels of whānau well, well-being. The really interesting stuff w when we came up, when we started looking at human resource potential. And here um, we found two really, really powerful drivers of high levels of whānau well-being. And the first of those is that your whānau gets along really well. Now that worked for all ages, 
also working for all ages was having a very high level of, of life satisfaction. So what we can say from this is it's actually for high levels of whānau well-being has got something to do with the relationships within the whānau and the quality of those relationships. But also those people who, are, um, who, who see the well-being of their whānau in a really positive light are also more, most likely to regard their own lives as doing really well. So there's a, there's a strong link between individual level um, well-being and whānau level well-being. So what are the policy implications of this? Well, it's not all about the money, folks, right? But we know that. What this shows us is that efforts to support whānau to thrive, to do really well, right, not just cope, right, to do really well, means that we have to be supporting the whānau networks that make that happen. So we need policies and processes and interventions that uffy um, whānau to support themselves, but also to um, provide individual whānau members a way to live their lives in a way that they find meaningful, because that also is strongly reflected. So we need a whānau level approach and, a, um, and an individual approach. So what about what's going on with measuring wellbeing? Well, I'm a big fan of the official data system. I think we have got, without doubt, one of the best official statistics systems on the planet. Um, unfortunately, it isn't designed to do the job that we're asking it to do. Okay? It, it evolved um, to do a particular task, and we're extending that, right? and extending it in ways that is actually challenging the system, but challenging it in a good way, because as the government statistician said with the pilot projects, the system does seem to be receptive to change. We just have to guide it. So what are some of the issues? Well, for a start, it's focused on individuals, households, uh, including families and businesses. And we're asking it to look and provide information on a different type of collective, and one that isn't necessarily consistent and doesn't necessarily live within four walls. Right? Some people, and one of the, the previous pieces of work that I did with Tahu looked at the, how people interpret what, um, or define their whānau. And about 30% of uh, respondents from Te Kupinga said that it was basically in terms of nuclear family, and about another 30% said it's uh, multiple generations. Right? So there's a big diversity there, and we're asking an official statistics system to actually account for that diversity. My big concern as a person who plays in this space, or works in this space, but it feels like play most days, is that the quality of the data that we're asked to, asked to play with. Now, this is not Statistics New Zealand's fault. In fact, they are the leaders in this. There are still some improvements to be done. But one of the big things of missing data is about Māori, dis uh, Māori descent data. Right. Health, education and welfare systems do not collect um, Māori descent data. The only source of Māori descent data inside that extremely powerful IDI system that the government statistician mentioned is the census. So if we're missing from the census, we're missing in the IDI. Right? Also, the quality of the iwi information. Right? Yes, it's under review at the moment. Um, that, uh, but some people would... All, I've also had people say, well, is it Stats New Zealand's job to actually define who the iwi are? Is there another way of doing this? Right? And I think that's something that we're, um, we as, as Māori researchers and policy makers and, and whānau advocates and anybody who plays in this space are actually going to have to address how, we, how do we account for iwi in the official data system in a way that benefits iwi. Right? A serious concern, especially in Auckland at the moment, is mobility. Official data mean it requires you to be counted. To be counted, it's easier to count something if it's still. Right? If it's moving four times a year, and changing medical practices four times a year, and the health data is the most linked there is, so it's the easiest to find people, people disappear, right? The housing crisis is not only affecting our people directly, it's affecting the quality of the information that we need to inform the decisions to, do, um, to improve the well-being of our planet. And it's serious. I've had PHOs say, look, we lose a third of our Māori every year. We don't know where they've gone. We know they're somewhere. Um, and if they, 
and so they disappear out of the statistics, and if you're not counted, right, you're not valued. So what else, what are the other ch changes? Well, adding a whānau well-being means that we're actually changing the focus of, of the uh, stat system, and we're adding some measures that are actually some pretty hard conceptual things to measure, like whānau and like well-being. Um, so maybe we're actually asking a bit much of the official stat system. But also, we're creating a whole new audience. The official statistics system was designed to, to inform decision makers at the government, business, and occasionally individual level. We are now reorientating that. It has a new audience, us. It has to be accessible to us. It has to be meaningful to us. And it has to be useful to us. But with the collecting of collective information comes some new obligations. We have an ethics system in New Zealand based, um, sourced on some of the more outrageous behaviours of my alma mater um, that is based on individual consent. But we're now talking about knowledge about collectives. So who has the right to give consent about the aggregation, analysis and publication about um, data about Māori collectives. So it has imp implications for the consent process. And we're going to see this with the, um, the initiative that I haven't, I'm just going to mention, I'm not going to talk about, but the social investment unit requiring information from service providers. They are going to have identifiable information about our whānau members. Right. What obligations do they have? That discussion needs to be had. But also, the, the new, this new era, uh, era creates new data producers. Anybody here involved with Rapper Water? Who's fit to? Yeah, Rapper Water? Okay. We show, uh, the Māori Women's Welfare League showed in the 1980s that we are extremely good data collectors. One of the things is that maybe uh, it's to consider is maybe that Stats New Zealand isn't the be-all and end-all in the official data system, uh, in collecting data. They do an amazing job with official data, big fan, use their data all the time. But maybe there's some stuff that we could do for ourselves locally, right? We've done it before. The League did an amazing job with um, Rapper Water. In fact, I've got a photo of my, on my wall of Tar Mason um, giving, a, giving a speech. In fact, it was the creation of Whare Tapa Whaa. Um, and which came out of uh, rough order. So maybe that's something we need to think about, is creating and collecting our own information. So can we actually do all this in the existing system? Can we modify it? The, it has shown some flexibility, but I think we actually have to be prepared to create our own system. And it's going to cost, but whatever it does, right, it has to be consistent and useful for everybody. So what are some opportunities in measuring Māori data? Well, first of all, is the data system that currently exists is both high quality and extremely high trust. When I signed a little document about accessing data, it mentions word like prism in it. Um, so, it, it, and getting access to the data is pretty hard. Um, which as a researcher, it, it, I find frustrating, but I, it also protects me as well as the data. With the official statistics having to kūpenga, and it's great to hear that the sample size is going to be increased, because um, uh, that gives the study much more power, um, we can actually begin to look at change across time. The EWI leaders have actually got a data group, um, have formed a data group to start looking at uh, data um, issues with the Crown and have that mana conversation. And as the government statistician has mentioned, there's already pilot projects happening, um, looking at changing um, creating pathways for change within the official data system. There are some other opportunities. The National Science Challenges has the opportunity to create life course based work um, across three challenges. It's a great, um, there is great potential there when that gets renewed in about two years' time. But what I want you to go away from here thinking about is what about Māori as data users and producers? Right? What about do, creating our own data in terms of iwi development? creating our own data in terms of regional development. Now, um, we've already heard about the Ruhupe Transformation Project, um, supported by the Makaiti sisters doing exactly that. But also, um, we're getting service providers um, creating data that we could actually use um, to inform whānau development. 
But whatever we do, we've got to, we have to do it now. We're in a development stage now, and that development stage means that we can actually create the pilots and create the pathways that others can follow. Because whatever we do has to be scalable, it has, and it has to be transferable. There's no point developing a system that works in one spot and doesn't work somewhere else if it's good. Okay. What it, this data is too precious, and we need a, a, a system that can be rolled out nationally to benefit Ngā Iwi Kato. So in terms of future directions, the key thing about a future direction is it needs a director. And what I see is that whānau wellbeing needs to guide the entire data collection system, not just the official data system, right? not just government projects, not just um, the lo longitudinal projects, and on that we actually think we've got a design for a new Māori longitudinal project using existing data only. Um, but iwi and hapu need to actually have a voice in that and guide it, because that's how we'll get change, but that's also how we'll get consistency, because we can't go through the system that um, we had in the 1980s, where Stats New Zealand had to go and tidy up a myriad of different ways of measuring ethnicity and Māori identity across different government agencies. So creating new tools that are fit for a new purpose are going to involve co-design, co-governance of shared responsibilities, of shared resources, and building Māori capability and capacity. We can't, uh, successful as it was for creating Māori doctors, right, we can't wait 20 years to create Māori statisticians and number crunches. We need innovative ways to make that happen tomorrow. And some of it means that we're actually going to have to have some partnerships going on. Now, some acknowledgements. Uh, the work for uh, the publication that, that's about to be blessed, thank you very much to the uh, Superu Whanau Reference Group um, and Fetu and Kahui Kori and Violeta and Bev. Um, Scott and Jason, thank you. Um, Matt, who's up in Whangarei, uh, for his, he did the analysis for us. Uh, Patricia Bowman, uh, sorry, Patrick Bowman, um, provided some assistance with the literature review. And my wonderful student, Natalia Bowman, and two professors helped us out, out with the CURF um, data because occasionally this stuff gets really, really hard. Um, a little plug for Tahu. If you want to contact Tahu, that's her address. And whoops, so it's not. Yep, that's her address, and that's my address uh, underneath it. I'm very happy to answer any emails, but occasionally I might need reminders. And one final plug for Tamana Rauranga, which you'll hear more about tomorrow. Kia ora koutou.